objects of interest. This is not saying something about that. It's actually giving you a property. And this property, basically, of parallel lines, how many parallel lines there are, is some something that is being, it's a property that is being handed to you. And now, the problem that was posed by Euclid was the following. Because it does not have the same status as the first four axioms, the problem he posed was, can you prove the fifth postulate from the remaining four axioms? This was a problem that Euclid posed. And another giant, Gauss, actually found the solution 2,000 years after Euclid had posed the problem. We'll talk about that now. The attempt to prove the fifth postulate from the other postulates, this is what gave rise to the field that we're talking about today, namely the field of hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so let's go back to a little bit of history, just as I said now. Gauss started thinking of parallels in the late 18th century, 1792. In about 30 years, a little more than 30 years, he had actually solved the problem and in a letter to his friend, Taurinus, he wrote that the assumption that the sum of the angles of a triangle is less than two right angles leads to a geometry which is quite different from Euclidean geometry, but which is itself completely consistent. So he is assuming yet another formulation of the parallel postulate. The parallel postulate is equivalent to the statement that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. How do you prove that? How do you prove that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees? If you draw a line through the vertex of a triangle parallel to the base, alternate angles are equal, so the one on the right side is equal to the one on the right side in the base, the one on the left side is equal to the, the one on the base on the left side, and there's this interior angle. So the sum of the angles of the triangle is equal to the sum of three angles around a vertex on a straight line, which is two right angles. Right? So that's the proof that we learned in school. And so basically you prove, once you have this parallel postulate, you can prove that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Reverse that argument that I just gave you, it will tell you that there's one and only one straight line through the vertex of a triangle, which is parallel to the base. Why? Because if you take two of these lines, they'll both have 180 degree sums for the three angles, and a smaller angle will have to be equal to a larger angle. Clearly a contradiction. <coughs> so, so, this part of the story, basically, I mean, you can, you can rework all this stuff, one, one from the other. Okay. So now, um, this was, so, so basically, Gauss's formulation of the fifth postulate is this, that the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So when he says that I found a geometry <laughs> which is consistent, a geometry means the first four axioms of Euclid that we talked about, and that the sum of the angles of the triangle is less than 180 degrees, what he is basically saying is that I found a geometry which satisfies the first four axioms, but does not satisfy the fifth axiom, does not satisfy the parallel postulate, does not satisfy the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So, what's the conclusion? The conclusion basically is something rather surprising. It means basically that, look, Euclidean geometry exists. So, the fifth postulate and the first four axioms, they give rise to some system of geometry. What is Gauss saying? You remove that axiom, replace by its negation. Yeah? Some of the angles equal to 180 degrees, some of the angles less than 180 degrees. They certainly are not consistent, right? Equal to cannot be less than. But you throw away the equal to axiom and replace by a strictly less than axiom, and you still get a consistent system of geometry. That's what Gauss is saying here. Which means what? That means the first four axiom and the equality axiom gives rise to one geometry. First four axioms and the strictly less than axiom gives rise
applies to another system of geometry. All both these systems are consistent, which means that this fifth axiom can neither be proven from the remaining four axioms, nor can it be disproven, assuming the remaining four axioms. That's the conclusion. So the problem that was posed was prove the fifth axiom from the remaining four. Yeah? Some people would have tried to prove it, some people would have tried to disprove it. What this conclusion is basically saying is that, look, it's an independent axiom. It neither follows from the others, nor does its negation follow from the others. So this actually is an instance of perhaps the deepest form, I mean, deepest theorem of uh, mathematical logic, which came in the early 20th century. Any guesses? Yes, yes, up, oh, raise your volume, somebody guess, yes. Yes, the Goodell's incompleteness theorem, yeah? The Goodell's incompleteness theorem basically says that you cannot prove the consistency of an axiom system from within itself, so long as it's a second order. There's a mild reduction. Okay, so this was, I mean, this particular discovery of hyperbolic geometry is actually a pointer to this foundation. Foundations of mathematics lie in logic. So there's this foundational, foundational issue which it is hinting towards. Okay, back to history. Gauss did not publish his work. Um, even around the 18th century, um, you might have heard of this hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, cos h, sine h, etc., etc. We start off by sine cos tan when we learn trigonometry. Yeah? Well, that's basically because we live in, I mean, we think we live in Euclidean space. Yeah? So the natural trigonometry is done through sine cos tan, etc. But the, there are hyperbolic analogs of this also. And in the 18th century, somebody called Lambert introduced these things, the hyperbolic sine, cosine, tangent, etc., etc., and these were used to compute areas of what is called a hyperbolic triangle, a triangle in the geometry that Gauss discovered. Then after Gauss, five or six years after Gauss had discovered, two mathematicians, a Hungarian mathematician called Bodhiai and a Russian mathematician called Lobachevsky, independently discovered hyperbolic geometry, which means basically doing the same thing that Gauss had discovered. And sometimes this hyperbolic geometry is named after Lobachevsky, it's also called Lobachevsky geometry. So Lobachevsky published in 1829-30, Bolyai published two years subsequently, and this new geometry came into existence. It did not have the name hyperbolic geometry then. That was coined by Felix Klein in 1871. And the person who really ran with it was this French person, French mathematician, very often regarded as the last great universalist, covered all areas of mathematics, and I was, I was actually reading a biography of him some days back, uh, Jules Henri Poincaré, yeah, so Jules Henry Poincaré. Um, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics 41 times or something like that. Yeah. So he's still the most nominated person for a Nobel Prize. Yeah. That's, that's what Poincaré is. So the, but we know him as a mathematician. I mean, he covered everything. All of mathematics he touched. Okay, and that's the person who's, who really took this forward and all the modern theory rests on his work. And that's the treatment that we'll give today, based on Poincaré. Okay, so now let's uh, reformulate the parallel postulate, and we'll reformulate it in precise terms. The thing is, Euclid was actually assuming something. See, we are doing, when, when Euclid talks about some of the angles of a triangle, etc., etc., what he's talking about is a triangle in a plane parallelized in a plane. That's assumed ahead of time. Yeah? And the axioms for him define the plane. 
But suppose we ask that there is some kind of, kind of circularity involved, that these axioms, they define for us a certain geometry, and what it rests on is the Euclidean plane. But if we start asking more probing questions, what really is the hypothesis? What really is the Euclidean plane? And what is the context in which these axioms hold? Then we are really trying to probe deeper. And this was the real question that needed to be asked. The assumptions were hiding the context, and the probing had to be done by basically examining the context in which the axioms held. This context in formal logical terms is also called a model, a model for geometry. So the model for Euclidean geometry is the plain paper, R2, with the usual something on which we do our, on which we draw our straight lines and stuff. Yeah? So for example, this, the square plate here. So let's look at the parallel postulate again. What does it say? Given a straight line L in a plane P and a point X on the plane line outside the line L, then there exists a unique straight line L prime lying on the plane P passing through X and parallel to L. I, what, what have we done? We've just reiterated in plane P, in plane P, in plane P three times at least. Yeah? One plane P, yeah. Yeah, capital P of those three times. Good. So, then, what, what does Euclid's problem become? The problem that Euclid posed was prove the parallel postulate from the other axioms of Euclidean term. Okay? So, now we've looked at the history and now we've re reformulated the problem in terms of fairly precise and we've thrown away all the flab, and we've concretized the problem in fairly precise terms. Good. Now let's look at, so we, this is basically this, so this in plane P, in plane P, in plane P, three times, what has it done? It's basically exposed a certain assumption that's there in Euclid's geometry. So for example, you have this plane, flat plane, and you take a point outside it in three-dimensional space. Through that point and through a line lying on the plane, you can have zillions of lines which never meet that, right? So just take a take a line parallel to the plane and rotate it about any point. Yeah? So all those lines are going to be parallel to the original line. They will never meet. Yeah? <coughs> we call them skew lines, but that's just the name. Parallel lines are lines which never meet. So so he's, but the point is that then there are infinitely many lines and certainly Euclid is not talking about such a thing. So really Euclid is talking about plain Euclidean geometry. And so excavating and exposing this hidden assumption is just the first part of the job. Next, ask what is a plane? So what really is a plane? We are asking for a more fundamental description of what a plane is. Once you have the notion of a plane P, yeah, then the notion of a straight line emerges automatically. How? Given two points, yeah. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll come to this a little later. Let, let's let's postpone this question. So let's put list the questions first. What is a plane P? And from this basic answer about what a plane P is, we want to deduce something special about straight lines. Third, what is the notion of parallelism? So basically we are re-examining the players in the game except that we are, we are actually examining something deeper, namely not just the players in the game, we are examining the game itself. The game itself is defined by this plane. What are the rules? What are the things that define the plane P? Not things that live on the plane P, not straight lines, not circles, not straight line segments, not right angles, but the plane P itself, yeah? Without all these decorations, what is it? That's the question that's being asked here, okay? So some more fundamental description is being sought. And from that, we'd like to deduce 
we'd like to think of a straight line as emerging from that notion of a plane. Yeah. Notion of parallelism emerging from it. Fair enough. So first, let me give you a quick answer to the first question, what is a plane P? Answer for Euclidean geometry. So what's the plane P? Answer. The Euclidean plane is R2, equipped with a way of measuring distances. So this is called a metric. This is called a ds square equal to dx square plus dy square. You remove the d, and you have Pythagoras theorem. Yes? So this is an infinitesimal form of the Pythagoras theorem. Right? So this is just some, some formula. It looks like some mysterious package. But, so what does, what does that formula mean? It basically means that it gives, it's a package which allows you to extract lengths of all smooth curves. So take a smooth curve, it's a smooth map of 0, 1, closed interval into R2, and you parameterize it by x of t, y of t. This is how we compute lengths of paths in class 12, right? Rectification, I think that's what it's called. That, that's got a meaning. Rectification means basically making it straight. So here we are really approximating an arbitrary curve by very small straight line segments and then summing it. Yeah? So what is it? This is computed by, computed by the formula that the length is equal to the integral of the line element, ds. But what is ds? It's square root dx square plus dy square. But suppose you have used a parameterization x equal to x of t, y equal to y of t. But what is dx? dx is x prime t dt. dy is y prime t dt. Yeah? So the integrand becomes x prime t square plus y prime t square whole square root times dt integrated from 0 to 1. Yeah? So that little formula, which otherwise is meaningless, this ds square equal to dx square plus dy square is just some bunch of some way of packaging that. What it is, is what it does. And what it does is it gives you, it eats an arbitrary smooth curve, spits out the length according to this integral formula. Okay, so this, just in order to understand the context, that means having a reasonable answer to what is a plane P, we need this notion of a metric. This should tell you why I mean, this is a part of the answer to why it took so long. Euclid started off in 200 BC. But this is, what is the field of mathematics this is, this is supposed to be about? Yes? Calculus. calculus. Very good. When did calculus come about? Who did, who discovered it? Newton. By Leibniz and Newton. Very good. Around what time? So basically, we have already covered 1600 and something, so mid-17th mid, mid, mid century. So how, how many years have we covered already out of those 2000? Something like 1800 plus years, right? So in order to even get, firstly, there's a, there's a deep problem hidden there. The context was not revealed. You could not think of it. And the problem is hidden really in the context. It's, it rests on asking what the plane is that you get this answer. So first, that's the problem. So excavating and thinking that, look, it's not just doing something by taking us some bunch of axioms and putting them together, assembling them together. But it's asking more basic questions about what the context of those axioms is. Realizing that, then asking this more fundamental question, so what exactly is the context? Can we have more precise ways of thinking of it? That required calculus to answer that question, and calculus came 1800 years later, right? So we have already covered 1800 years of those 2000 years because the context had to be discovered by coming up with completely new field of mathematics. Okay, so really you require calculus to answer this question. Okay, so that's then it occurs. So this is the answer for. <coughs> Euclidean geometry. Okay, so what we have, we had this three three questions, right? We had this first question, what is a plane P? We've answered that. Now, once we have an answer to what is the plane P, 
we need an answer to what is a straight line segment. And in terms of the metric, the straight line becomes something very natural. Straight lines are the unique distance minimizing curves on the flat plane B. Okay? So once you've defined the flat plane B and you're given two points, you don't have to have a straight line as an axiom. It is the unique distance minimizing curve between those two points. You're given a name, call it a straight line. So forget that you knew the word straight line. And now you have this shortest path between two points. That now has a new name. And we'll be actually generalizing that. Distance minimizing curves have a name. They're called geodesics. Yeah. One other example, quickly. Basically, on the surface of the Earth, what, what are the routes that planes take? Yeah, they, they would certainly want the same pool, right? So if they want the same pool, they take the shortest paths. Assuming that there is no political turmoil over some place, yeah? So, it will take the shortest paths. What are those shortest paths? Mathematicians usually tend to ignore all these political complications. They are never very, the mathematics is much easier. Yeah? So, we stick to that. Yeah? So, what are the shortest paths? Great circles. Yes? Great circles. So, great circles, what are great circles? Basically, take a plane passing through the center of the earth and look at the circle at which it intersects the boundary sphere. Namely the earth. Yeah? And those are the distance minimizing paths. Yeah? So those also have a name, they are called they are, they are geodesics on the surface of the earth. So distance minimizing path is what we are after. It's the coincidence that in the Euclidean plane they are called straight lines. Okay? So now we can forget straight lines and just think of geodesics. And now what we are really talking about is by infinite geodesics in the plane. What is a parallelism? Two straight lines are now parallel if they just do not intersect. That's all you need. Okay? Two by infinite straight lines are parallel if they don't meet. This is something that you can bring out from, from this background geometry. Yeah? Now, use this little package, ds square. This is a class 12 thing. ds square where we learn calculus. ds square equals to dx square plus dy square. Use that model for the plane. Now, basically, you can introduce Cartesian geometry. Given any straight line and a point outside it, the original straight line must have some slope little n. So in order to be parallel to that, in this model, ds square equal to dx square plus dy square, the other line through another point p, what does it have to be? It has to be y minus y1 by x minus x1 equal to m, where m is the slope. It doesn't have a choice. So once you impose that the metric, the way you measure distances, is ds square equal to dx square plus dy square, you don't have a choice. The fifth axiom is forced on you. Right? So first four axioms plus this extra data of this answer to this question, what is a plane B, gives rise to the fifth postulate. Yeah? The fifth postulate not only the notion of a straight line, the notion of parallelism, the notion of the fifth postulate, all these emerge from this one single little package called ds square equal to dx square plus dy square. Okay, infinitesimal Pythagoras. Yeah? So this little package yields everything. So in order to answer that question, therefore, of deducing whether the fifth postulate can be deduced from the other four axioms or not, what do we have to do? It means then we'll have to come up with another variation. So Pythagoras prime, different Pythagoras. Yeah? Pythagoras 2000 years after Pythagoras. Yeah? Some new formula, some new package for measuring distances. Once you have that, then you will be able to ask the question, what are the shortest, shortest path, what are the geodesics in this new geometry? And once you have that, then you ask, does it satisfy the fifth postulate? Mm. Any model of geometry, which means changing this infinitesimal Pythagoras in a little way, it will basically have to satisfy the remaining four axioms. That's an easy check. But once you have that, the question that is being asked really is whether all these models satisfy, not just one model, not just this Euclidean geometry, ds square equal to ds, uh, ds square equal to dx square plus dy square model, but whether all models satisfy the fifth postulate.
it or not. That's the depth of Euclid's question. Euclid certainly did not understand. Okay? <coughs> okay. So this comes up now. So now we look at a formulation. And essentially, so now let's try to see basically what has, what has happened so far is that we've exposed and understood where the problem has to be attacked. The point of attack is this ds square equal to dx square plus dy square. But when we write ds square equal to dx square plus dy square, there's another thing we don't write. We never write it. Basically, it's 1 times dx square plus 1 times mm. dy square. If somebody wrote it, we think that the guy is crazy. Mm. But it's important, it's very important. It's necessary to write that 1 because that 1 there is not a number. It's actually the constant function 1 on the whole plane. What's the role that these, these are mathematical symbols, they mean something. And that number one, which we don't write in front of dx square, should be understood as the constant function one on the plane, not the number one. The number one makes no sense then. Yeah. And so, that's the place where we really, I mean, this is, this is how much it took to expose the point of attack of the problem. So now we'll have to, so basically we'll have to modify that. So that's the point of attack. So once that point of attack has been identified, you change things around there. So metric on a subset of R2, the general object now, ds square equal to sub f times dx square plus g times dy square. Now we've changed things. Yeah. Instead of constant function 1, we replaced one of the coefficients by f, one of the other coefficients by, by g. Now once you have these two by gadgets, f and g, all that you need is it assigns positive length to parts. So for that what you need, you want f to be positive, g to be positive, nothing else. Good. So once you have that, once you have f and g smooth positive, now you can think of length. Now what is the length? The length is this integral of ds as before, but the formula has changed. It's going to be square root f times x prime square plus g times y prime square whole square root dt. Yeah. Okay. So now what have, what are we left to do? We found the point of attack. We have now found earlier we didn't even have the metric. We excavated and found that look, this is the place where the problem needs to be attacked. What was it? So now what do we need to do? We need to choose f and g appropriately. Choose f and g and ask whether for arbitrary choice of f and g or for some new, new kind of choice of f and g is the fifth postulate violated. That's the question we are asking. Yeah. Can we change the model? This is the model. Yeah. f equal to g equal to one constant function 1 is the Euclidean geometry model. But now we have arbitrary f and g. We have to choose f and g properly so that we can actually compute the geodesics in this model and answer the question whether the fifth postulate is being satisfied. It's very easy to see that whenever you have a package like this, ds square equal to f times dx square plus g times dy square, where f and g are smooth positive functions, then the remaining four axioms of Euclidean geometry that we start off with, straight line segments, bind with straight lines, circles, uh, right angles, all that is satisfied. The fifth guy is what's left. That's what we need to examine. And the problem, therefore, is a choice of f and g. So, according to one of, perhaps, the universal geometer alive today, Michel Romov, the Russian mathematician residing in France, um, <laughs> there are two ways of doing mathematics. There's one which is energy intensive, which means you excavate and find out structures by digging deep. That's what this part of it was. The discovery of calculus as relevant to this problem was digging out some structure which was completely not there on the surface. But once you've dug it out, the second, this is the other kind of mathematics, it's what, what he like, likes to call entropy minimizing. Now you have zillions and zillions of paths available to you. You could go this way, you could go that way, and you have to make a choice. The correct choice is what you have to make. Here, you could choose f equal to x squared, g equal to 
x square plus y square. Something could be x cubed plus y to the 3 pair. How many functions we have? We have uncountably many functions. We have to choose one out of them. Yeah? So it's the choice is far worse than a needle in a haystack. People who think that hunting for a needle in a haystack is hard, never do mathematics. Yeah? So they don't understand that it's it's really much harder when you are given this uncountable choice. You have to pick the point at random. Uh, you want to pick a point which satisfies what you need. Yeah? That's basically it's it's not just probability zero. Yeah? Making the correct choice is not just a probability zero event. It's a probability zero event in a very terrible way. You have uncountably many choices you want to choose a point there. One such field, I'll just mention as an aside, is something called transcendental number theory. Yeah? Uh, you know what transcendental numbers are? Yeah? Algebraic numbers are numbers which satisfy algebraic equations. Yeah? That's a countable <coughs> algebraic equation with coefficients from integers. So that's a countable number. Since it's a countable number, the complement is full measure in the real life. Yeah? So if you pick a point at random with probability 1, it's transcendental. Yeah? It's not algebraic. Proving any single number you pick is actually transcendental is an incredibly difficult problem. E is transcendental, requires some big shot. Pi is transcendental, requires another big shot. I think one of these two, either e power pi or pi power e is transcendental, is still an open problem. Okay? That's how hard it is. But you just put, I mean, anybody can manufacture. Take e power e power e power e 55 times. Ask, is it transcendental? Nobody knows. I certainly know. Yeah. So that's how hard it is. I mean, it's basically picking. See, here you're, you're not, you're saying, okay, almost all of them. So if you pick a fellow at random, it, it is going to be, be transcendental. But pick it. Picking it and tell, showing you if this is the number and it's transcendental, very hard. Yeah? So it's really, now you have to pick this f and g correctly. That's the problem. Okay? So it's a, earlier the problem was one of poverty, now it's one of riches. Yeah? Now you have huge number of things available, you don't know which one will, will do the job for you. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, earlier, this problem surfaces in statistics also. Earlier we used to have these small samples, they would have to tell us things about the population, which was much larger, yeah? So mean, median, mode, standard deviation, all the stuff that you learn in basic statistics. Now the problem has become the opposite. You have a huge amount of data. All this stuff about big data, etc., etc. Fundamentally, there's this mathematical problem. What is the right statistic? What is the right thing to examine which will actually represent the population and not tell you any story that you like? Yeah? So it's changed. It's changed from Sample telling you about the population to this completely different paradigm. It's been an inversion of paradigm. Yeah. So that's that's what this is about. Okay, good. So now let's look at this problem again. <coughs> and so this is the answer for more general geometry. And now we'll pick a metric properly. So before picking the metric, we'll just say it put some generalities. Given two points, <coughs> say in R2, the genesic is the shortest path that realizes the distance as per this formula. Isometry is something that <laughs> preserves distance <coughs> infinitesimally. So which means in terms of formulae, if x, y goes to x1, y1, then f times x dx square plus g times dy square is f evaluated at x1, y1, dx1 square plus g times x1, y1, dy1 square. Okay? All right. So basically, isometries generalize the stuff that we, we looked at in uh, school. Side angles, excuse me, side angle side congruency, angle angle side congruency. So what's, what's, what's all this congruence stuff about? Three sides congruence. What does that mean? It means basically that there's an isometry of the plane, mm. distance preserving map of the plane, taking the first triangle to the second triangle. Mm. Exactly, without changing this. That, so this, this is actually, this isometry is a generalization of all these congruence theorems that we studied in class 6. Good. So now, we'll pick, we'll do this picking. Where this, how, what guided, I mean, a, a, a choice is actually, you have to choose the, choose the metric correctly, right? So this choice has to be accurate, 
And this really comes from a completely different field of mathematics, basically complex analysis. A model for hyperbolic geometry, as you said, we need to pick first a subset of the plane and a metric. So what's the subset we choose? The subset we choose is the upper half plane. There's a metric for the full plane also, but for the full time, you end up calculations become much easier if you choose h to be equal to the upper half plane. And the metric is very close to the Euclidean metric when you divide the Euclidean metric by y squared. So f of xy equal to g of xy equal to 1 by y squared. That's your metric. One simple thing, look at the vertical x-axis. Yeah? Start, look at the point 1. Yeah? Basically the point i, i on the upper half plane, yeah? which means 0, x, 0, y, 1. And now look at the vertical line going to 0, 0. What is the length of that part in the Euclidean sense? It's just 1. What's the length in the hyperbolic matrix? Then you have to look at ds. What is ds? ds is equal to square root dx square plus dy square by y square. What is that? x does not change. Just because it's, a, it's x equal to constant length. So it's what? Square root dy square by y square. What is that? dy by y. What is dy by y? y changing from 1 into 0? Log y. Log, log y mod. First, in the initial point, it's 1. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's right. So log 1, that's going to be minus. I mean, that's, so it's log, zero, log some t, t tending to 0, minus log 1 mod as t tends to 0 limit. What's that? That's infinity. So something from our Euclidean perspective, which has length 1, has in this hyperbolic sense length infinity. Yeah. So this, this vertical line is an example in this geometry of a by infinity limit. If you go up, then it's again from 1 to infinity. So again, that's log infinity, that's also infinity. Yeah. So this vertical line is an example of a by infinity limit. We haven't said, we haven't proven that. But uh, we'll come to that in the next slide. So where does this metric come from? That's a different story. It comes from complex analysis. Okay. So first theorem, right away, is that vertical straight lines in H are geodesics. In fact, the vertical segment between two points is the unique geodesic between A and B. So I'll tell you a quick computation. What is it? We basically, we just talked about it. What is it? It's the integral of square root dx square plus dy square. Yeah. And if you have two points on the same vertical, then certainly square root, so you have, you take some wiggly curve, but joining points on the same vertical, yeah. So what do you have? You have, you have to integrate square root dx square plus dy square by y. Certainly that's going to be greater than or equal to square root dy square by y, because dx square is going to be some x prime d square times dt, right? So you're removing a positive function, so that's going to be greater than or equal to. So that means it's going to be greater than or equal to the integral dy by y. Right? That's what means. So they, basically it means that if your x changes, which means that the path wiggles away from the vertical, you are going to pick up this extra term, x prime t squared dt. That's x, the square root x prime t squared. Yeah. Which means that the, the integrand will become larger. So the integral will become larger. Which means you're going to get something, uh, a path of greater length. It can't be this, it's minimizing. Right? So that's the proof that these vertical straight lines between two points is actually a geodesic. Not only is it a geodesic, it's the unique geodesic between two points on the same vertical. Okay? So the vertical straight lines in this new geometry with dx square plus dy square by y square, those are geodesics. It's a fact which we will not prove. The horizontal lines are not geodesics. Yeah? If you to put y equal to constant, you do not get geodesics in this geometry. What they are, we'll come to later on. We will end up, end up proving it, but in a different way. Second, look at translations. Just taking xy goes to x plus ay. What was the thing? So you have x comma y goes to x1, y1, right? So what is dx1? x1 is equal to x plus a. 
So dx1 is equal to dx. So that means what? Square root dx square plus dy square y is equal to y1. So square root dx square plus dy square by y square is the same thing as square root dx1 square plus dy1 square by y1 square. So that means translations are also isometries. So from this one vertical, the y-axis, you translate it around, you get all verticals are geodesics. Okay? Good. So all verticals are geodesics. And now I'll say something. This is a simple computation, but it really requires a vote. I prefer not to do this now. Uh, this is actually something that comes from geometric optics. Inversion about semicircles. So define, uh, define this map. This is called an inversion by... Let's, let's put capital R equal to 1. What is it? So you think of polar coordinates. Capital R, common, so the, a point is defined by little r, comma theta. What's the inversion? How would you, what would the, be the image of that under reflection in a spherical mirror of radius 1 centered at the origin? So semicircle, look at a semicircle on, on the center at 0, 0. In the in the up in, in the plane, yeah. And now you look at a point R comma theta. Where will that go if you reflect that? Assume that that semicircle R is the same little R is very large. Now you want to reflect it in the semicircle, which is mirrored. Yeah? So suppose you have a line coming in. What will happen is that it will try to go to the center of the circle, and the radius is just going to get flipped. This is a fact of geometric optics that we use. R comma theta goes to 1 by R comma theta. Yeah? Okay. So this is generalized by T sending. So in, in complex coordinates, it sends Z to R square by Z bar. Okay? Good. So for some, and this is this is basically the generalization of this inversion formula, but about semicircles of arbitrary radius R. Fair enough. Where z bar denotes the complex conjugate. So basically, z bar has gone to the denominator. That's why this theta has become, if you put it downstairs, it would have become minus theta. So that's why you change. Okay, good. This inversion, a little quick check, shows that this inversion is also an isometry. So then we can manufacture new geodesics in the plane. Yeah? And here's what we use. This is the observation. The image of a geodesic under an isometry, if something preserves distances, is certainly going to preserve distance minimizing part. Yeah. So the image of a geodesic under an isometry is going to give you another geodesic. In particular, the image of vertical geodesics under inversions is still a geodesic. So all that we need to do in order to manufacture another huge family of geodesics is invert all these vertical straight lines that we've gotten already about semicircles centered on the real map. That's all we really need to do. And it turns out that is enough. So here's a picture finally. <coughs> this is a nice exercise in in again, um, I mean, in Euclidean geometry, yeah, as soon as you know what a circle is, you can do this. So what is this? So this vertical line on which little c lies, yeah, that's a geodesic in the higher polygon. We know that. The same circle through little d, which touches, which is tangential to this vertical line at the right point, yeah, that's the same circle about which we want to invert. And what's the image of the inversion? So when you went, when you are inverting, what will happen is that the infinity, the plus infinity of the line through C will have to come to the to the center of the same circle, right? Because infinity times zero is equal to capital R square. That was the formula, right? What about other points? And this is an exercise in similar triangles. You look at A and you look at this smaller semicircle which passes through little a and this other end point at which it's tangential and take any point on that little b and you extend it till it hits the vertical line at point c. The claim is that the image of little c under inversion about the big semicircle is the point little b. Okay? That's the claim. And the proof is a simple 
proof, I mean, the proof is simple, basically using similar triangles in Euclidean geometry. What are they? So you take A, B, and let's call this point here X, yeah? So join B to X. Imagine you join B to this other point here, X. Then A, B, X, what's that angle? Yes? So A, B, X. X is here. 90, 90. 90, 90. X is here. Yeah. So A, B, and X. Yeah? 90, and the other degree. angle is? 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Very good. And the angle A, X, C is? 90. 90 degrees. Also 90, 90 degrees. degrees. And you have this angle C, A, X common to both triangles. Hmm. So the third angle is also the same. same. Hmm. So triangles <coughs> A, B, X and triangle A, C, X are similar triangles. Similar triangles. Right? Correct. From that, you do the ratio and you get this formula. L length of AB times length of AC is equal to length of AX squared. Yeah? Basically, you get AB divided by AX equal to AX divided by AC. Yeah? Okay? So that's, that's just taking what is that. You, you look at which angles are equal, just take the opposite side. Yeah? And you remove, I mean, you uh, take the numerator outside and you get this length of AB times length of AC is equal to length of AX squared. But AX is AD. So it's equal to AD. Right? So that means that the image of this vertical straight line under inversion about this large semicircle is just small semicircle. Conclusion is that every semicircle centered on the real line is a geodesic. Why? Now you invert the logic. Start with the small semicircle. Take a vertical straight line tangent to it on one end. Draw the larger semicircle. Then that smaller semicircle you started off with is the image of that vertical line you drew under inversion in the bigger semicircle you constructed. But the image of that vertical geodesic is a geodesic under inversion. So the small semicircle you started off with is still a geodesic. Clear? Yeah. So that means now we have got a huge family. Not only are the vertical straight lines geodesics, all semicircles centered on the real line are also geodesics in this geometry. Okay? With me so far? Good. So this means in the work in the hyperbolic plane, vertical straight lines are geodesics. Semicircular arcs with center on the real line are also geodesics. It's also a fact, we don't really need this, but these are the, all the geodesics. So we've gotten more than what we asked for. We wanted some geodesics, we've got this huge family. But actually, these are the only geodesics. And that really follows from what we've done. But with this extra information, that the vertical line is the unique geodesic between two points of the same place. Translate that to the same circle. The same circle is the unique geodesic touching two, uh, connecting two points on that same circle. Yeah? And any two points in the plane can be joined by a same circle centered on the rail. That's it. So these these are you don't need that, but it's it's something that you can quickly observe. Once you have this, yeah. Now the question is to take this vertical axis, take the y-axis, yeah. Take a point lying outside the y-axis, yeah. So which means what? Take x coordinate equal to 50, let's say. Y y coordinate equal to anything you like. Yeah. X equal to so x comma y with x equal to 50. How many, there's one vertical line for that. So certainly there's one line which is parallel to the first one. How about semicircles to that point? Take any point, so between 0 and 50 on the x-axis, take that point, join it to this 50 comma whatever point. Take the perpendicular bisector, look at where it hits the x-axis and draw another semicircle. So for every point on the x-axis between 0 and 50, you pick any point, that's going to give rise to a semicircle which intersects it. So let's say you take, pick a point between 0 and 50. Little a, yeah. Little a, that means the coordinates are a comma 0. X is a comma 0. What's, what was the point that you started off with? I've forgotten. So let's call it b comma c, yeah. So you take x comma 0, yeah. Join it by a Euclidean straight line to b comma c. Take the Euclidean perpendicular bisector. Look at the point at which it hits the x-axis. Take that point where it intersects as the center, the distance from either of these two points as a radius, and draw a semicircle. 
That's going to be a semicircle which passes to x comma 0 and t comma c. Why? Because you've taken the perpendicular bisector of the line joining this and you've gotten your center. So for every point little x which lies between 0 and 50, you have a semicircle centered on the real line passing through x comma 0 and t comma c. In particular passing through b comma c. So through B comma C there is the vertical line and infinitely many semicircles passing through that point not meeting the vertical y-axis. That's supposed to be the end of the story. I think we went a little fast there but really this is what's going on because now we have a new parallel postulate. What is it? Given a geodesic L in the hyperbolic plane, think vertical x vertical y-axis and a point x on h lies outside <coughs> l b comma c b not equal to zero yeah? there exist infinitely many by infinite geodesics l prime what are these these are the infinitely many semicircles centered on the x-axis passing through b comma c and x comma zero where x is strictly greater than zero and say it's strictly less than b so you have these infinitely many by infinite geodesics lie on the plane passing through x as parallel to your given line. Okay? That means what was our original parallel postulate? There is one and only one. It's violated in the most drastic way possible. Through any line, through a point outside it, there are zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of lines. But zillions is equal to uncomfortable. One for every point on the real line. Yeah? So it violates the fifth postulate in a very drastic way. Yeah? Upshot, we finished the end of the slides. Let me just give you a quick summary. So what happened? We basically asked for, we formulated Euclid's question, prove the parallel postulate assuming the remaining four axioms of geometry. What did we do? Basically asked the more fundamental question, what does a plate P mean? And we came up with this notion of a metric, a way of measuring distances. What is that? Just so the Euclidean thing is just d s square equal to d x square plus u i square. Yeah, infinitesimal Pythagoras. That has these coefficients: one constant function, one constant function. That's the point of attack. So we identified the point of attack for a problem. Change one to arbitrary function f. Change two to arbitrary function g. And then we have to choose appropriately f and g. What did we do? Instead of the plane, we chose the upper half plane. And we chose f equal to g equal to 1 by y squared. With that choice, what did we do? We computed what the geodesics are. What was the answer we got? We got they are vertical straight lines in the Euclidean sense and semicircles centered on the x-axis. So now, given a vertical line, the y-axis, at a point b comma c, b greater than 0, let's say, how many semicircles are there through B centered on the x-axis which do not meet the y-axis? Answer from some basic Euclidean geometry, infinitely many. Conclusion, take the first four axioms and replace the fifth postulate by through a straight line given any other point. There are infinitely many straight lines parallel to the first one. Parallel means not meeting. Yeah? They do not meet infinitely many straight lines parallel to the first line through this point. That gives rise to a consistent system of geometry. That's called it. So, the fifth postulate can neither be proven nor disproven from the remaining point. Okay.